Hi folks, Will at LR Workshop. I just wanted to put a bit of an intro on this video because this is a video series that I started uh, four years ago and the last video came out two years ago and my YouTube channel had less than a thousand subscribers when the last video came out so I realise that most people aren't probably aware of what this video series is. But essentially I was in Malawi and it was the first time I ever had my hands on a 70 series Land Cruiser and you know having lived through the internet conflict between Land Rovers and Land Cruisers. I really wanted to dig in and see, you know, what are the main differences? Like, how can I appreciate and understand what the differences are? And I'll film it and I'll make a video series out of, out of it. And um, and Harvey, one of my long-term subscribers, enjoys enjoys the series and uh, reminded me I need to get my, I need to pull my finger out and finish the series. So there's a few more videos to go. And you might find it interesting, I certainly do, having watched back through the, the footage anyway. And particularly as well, because in the UK we have no access to 70 series Land Cruisers, really. That's really where I wanted to get to with this series, is you know, showing people some of the, the key differences so that people can understand that there is another way to making utility 4x4s than just the Land Rover way. Anyway, hope you enjoy. Welcome to a Land Rover guide to the Land Cruiser. Land Cruiser chassis is more or less the same kind of design as the Land Rover, but being a ladder chassis, it's two big metal girders effectively running the length of the vehicle. And then the body is bolted on directly to that. That's in opposition to monocoque chassis, which a lot of modern vehicles are made that way. The, different, the main difference with the, the Toyota chassis is that it's, it doesn't run completely straight like a Land Rover chassis. So at the front, it runs where the engine, close into the engine, and then as it comes back here, it actually swings out. So it's got a bit of a kink in here, swings out, and then it goes wider for the rest of its journey to the back. That gives a benefit and it gives you more space here. And you see where the gearbox comes, it moves out, gives you a lot more space around the gearbox. Um, gives more bracing around where the cab is going to be that's where it gets wider and has a lot more weight um, and that means they can also fit the fuel tank into this area the other main difference is the way it's constructed now it's not as tall as a Land Rover chassis um, it's a little bit thinner as well so on the whole it's generally smaller the main difference is that it's built in a slightly different way it's still a box section but let me try and demonstrate this Put the camera down. Land Rover is made by taking two C sections of uh, steel and then putting to them together this way, and then you get a weld along the top and along the bottom. If you see like galvanized aftermarket chassis, they may be made with four separate plates, you know, they'll have welds along each of the, the corner edges. Whereas a proper, genuine Land Rover chassis is welded top and bottom in a C section like this. What Toyota have done is got one C-section slightly smaller and they've put it inside and then welded along the seam of the edges along there. So you, what you've got is double thickness, top and bottom of the, of the chassis. And that's really where it's going to take most of the stress is along the top and the bottom in compression and tension. So you've got a double thickness bottom on there which is, gives it a hell of a lot of strength which means they've probably been able to make it a smaller chassis and therefore they can make the body lower in relation to the ground because on a Land Rover the chassis is probably up about here and then that's when you can only start taking the, the body from. So this seems like a much more modern design in that respect. The brackets are all welded on for various mountings. Um, Similarly, these fill up with mud, just like on a Land Rover, with all the holes. Um, this gearbox box member is a lot easier to get out because it's bolted from the bottom. So you just undo these bolts and remove it. They've also got some nice features here, is you've got really easy access to the bolts on the bottom of the gearbox mounting. So that's a nice feature. Up here we've got another tubular cross member that goes across the top, similar to a Wolf Defender chassis. Um, 
the fender's got one similar, but it's more of a, a straight angled section that goes up and over the top of the around about where the handbrake drum is. So we've got a gearbox cross member and then the top over over the top cross member there. Moving backwards, we've then got a cross member here and this one's pretty beefy. It's not enclosed so it's not really going to be a rust trap um, but it's pretty strong it looks like it's quite big. This is probably more similar to the construction of the one by the transfer box on the Defender. Um, the Defender's got one big fat box section that runs between both sides here. That is a real rust trap because it's all enclosed in there. This is a lot more open. Same, we've got big brackets on the back here for the... the on the Land Rover the brackets tend to be all outboard and slightly underneath. These ones seem to be centrally mounted in the chassis which has allowed them to bring the suspension further in under the chassis. So a lot of the forces are working directly on the chassis as opposed to having like a lever effect on the outer edge. There's also outriggers here, just like on a Defender. And it's got bushes between the mountings to the body. I guess that's similar to the Discovery 1 and 2, um, whereas the Land Rover is directly bolted to the chassis. That has a problem of being a massive area of corrosion between the aluminium and the, and the actual chassis itself. Um, whereas these will probably give you a, um, a bit of a comfier ride or put a bit more roll in the body. Um, but they will degrade over time, you'll have to replace them. Um, whereas the Defender will give you corrosion if you live in that kind of salty, wet environment. Um, but it's a lot more rigid. You can feel that as the Defender moves over terrain, it kind of creaks and moves around, and that's because the body is completely rigidly attached to the chassis. Not sure which I prefer. Um, I've not tested this too much off-road, but I don't think it matters that much. Um, but not having electrolytic corrosion in the UK would be a massive bonus. The big difference with the body construction is the fact that it's all part of one pressed section. So the sills here are pressed in, they're not a separate section like on a Land Rover, which will essentially come along and get bolted into the equivalent of this, where they bolt the outrigger to the bulkhead, that's where the sill attaches into. Because they don't have this kind of construction, they've got a lot more freedom keep this outrigger a lot smaller, a lot more inboard and compact, and they've got the sills further out, down around here, into the back. And this out, so meaning this outrigger is a lot tinier um, than on the Land Rover, which comes out here to support the body, probably about this far out. The curve on the rear chassis is a lot less pronounced, it's a lot smoother, so it comes up slightly like this, a lot smoother gradient, the Land Rover will curve up quite high. Now there is a kind of a failure point around here on the Land Rover, they can crack somewhere between the spring mount on the, on the angle section down. On Wolf Defenders, you know, they put an extra plate on here, um, which gets welded in, you'll see that there's a strengthening section. Um, so I don't know which would be stronger, well I don't think Toyotas have a reputation for chassis cracking, as Defenders do. Um, but this is certainly a lot more gentler in its design, which means there's probably less stresses through the vehicle. We've got another tubular section in here, which is where the shock absorbers mount to. Um, there isn't this equivalent of cross member, I guess, on a Land Rover. We've always had the, on a Land Rover, you've got the, the cross member here, just in front of the, the spring housing. That's the equivalent of this one a bit further forward. So the spacing is quite different um, on this chassis. They've probably got more evenly spaced cross members whereas the Land Rover tends to cram a few in further back. This gives you more strength in this part of the chassis here because it, it's got the, the tubular box section going through that gives it a lot of stiffness around this point. Look at the back, there is no equivalent of the rear cross member on the Defender, so you just remove that rust trap entirely there. Um, I guess what you don't, on the Land Rover, it would curl back down, so you 
might have probably the land rover is probably around this level so this would in theory give you more ground clearance underneath but they've had to put, bring the chassis up to be able to get the spring to drop it to bring the springs a lot lower so you've got less ground clearance in the end and less of a departure angle particularly as well because of the spare tire being so there's no cross member well there's a bit of a i guess there is a rear cross member it doesn't seem quite as meaty i know the land rover later cross members have a reputation for being not very very strong compared to the earlier ones but this doesn't seem as as strong um, and it's not mounted to the body really in any way shape or form so the towing would come through this section here um, doesn't seem as it's not as big doesn't seem as strong as on a defender um, you're probably not going to get as much corrosion because it's not as big and it's out of the out of any water and rain dripping down here a lot more space in the top here so that gives good access to this part of the tub if you need it the Land Rover is very tight in there in front of the chassis has got its outrigger another outrigger right up the end here and the Land Rover it's kind of all bolted in with the wings and the wings are a structural element the front of the body here is attached to another outrigger which doesn't exist on the Land Rover um, through the bushes here Look at the chassis legs um, this one's been extended to put the ball bars on, which has been done a bit badly. We've got another tubular cross member here. The Land Rover is quite a bit stronger. Um, the Land Rover has a, a thick square cross section cross member. This one's tubular. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter. You just need it to brace the chassis front and back. In terms of an accident, I don't know, I think they both perform as poorly as the other one because they're both just big girders of steel with no crumple zones. Towing mount, the towing eyes, and the Land Cruiser are fixed in here, so if they wear or break you can't replace them. This one's got some, this one's got some wear in it on here. What is a bit of a bodge on the front of the chassis is this arm here. Now this is a bracing arm from what is the, the, the panhard bracket here. It's quite far down from the chassis, so it's quite a, quite a lever moment effect on the panhard rod. So what they've done is just weld on this bar here, the hollow bar, just, just looks like a bit of scrap metal lying around in a scrapyard, um, and then welded it into here to give it some kind of strength on a lateral basis. I presume that's because they've made the chassis quite thin, it doesn't drop that far. Um, so this bracket's actually gonna droop quite a lot. Why well, they couldn't have attached this a bit higher up here and have this this bracket shorter, I'm not too sure, but it just feels like a bit of a bodge. Certainly Land Rover's, because it's bolted, it allows them to keep the chassis unhanded, as it were, and then they just bolt on the bracket left or right, depending on whether it's left or right hand, right hand drive. And here they've actually got to manufacture the chassis depending on it being left or right-handed. So it mean, means making a conversion if you're moving between countries um, makes that a bit harder. Because you'd have to cut this off and weld something on the other side. It probably, probably wouldn't be worth it in a Toyota. In the end, the chassis on the Land Cruiser is, I think, actually better designed. It uses up less space, so you've got more room above and below. Um, so you can bring the body lower or ground clearance higher. Um, there's definitely more ground clearance here between me and the me and the chassis. On the Land Rover, it's probably about here. Um, so that's more ground clearance when you're going over like the ramp breakover angle. Um, um, but and also, it's got double thickness top and bottom. So it's smaller, more space, and it's potentially stronger where it matters in the compression and tension parts of the chassis. So it's probably just a bit more of a modern design. It's probably just a bit better, really. Um, Toyota chassis don't necessarily have a reputation for cracking, whereas I know Land Rover chassis do or can crack, particularly on 130s. There was a, a spate of... Um, high lift uh, the Hayab 
trucks um, on 130 like single cab chassis were snapping a few years ago. I've not particularly heard about that with Toyotas, so they probably have got a better chassis at the end of the day. Click here to go to the next video. Right here. That's where the button is. Right there.